Hello everyone, welcome to a new series I'm going to start doing where I'm going to be sitting down with people in the Overwatch competitive scene, talking to them about some of the latest roster moves, their latest games. So my first guest on this series is going to be Kasaurus, who is probably one of the bigger roster announcements over the past couple of weeks, the announcement of what is really a super team due to dominate America. Welcome Kasaurus, and I think the first bit to start is with that roster, because the situation is... You're probably one of the most financially well-off supported orgs in NA, at least within Overwatch. How do you go about picking from probably almost every Overwatch player in the world would have entertained an offer from you? How do you filter down everyone who's got the game installed into the five players you actually want to compete with this year? Right, so because Toronto already said from a very early start that it wanted to be invested and it wanted to be in Overwatch post Overwatch League. I actually got to do my job very early. Uh, and the way I wanted to go about it is Toronto basically came to me and asked, how do we win at least North America next year and are very competitively internationally? How do we do that? And I said, uh, we don't know what the rules are going to be yet. But if they're looking at regional tournaments in other games, import lock is something that's come up in, in just about every game right now. So we were pretty convinced even early on that there would be an import lock. So I started talking to a lot of the Korean players and started thinking, hey, if I can just secure two of the best Korean players, then the NA, the best NA players will naturally want to play with them because they want to win in their region as will be one of the only teams importing uh, players. So I talked to a lot of the top Korean players. Initially, I was actually pretty keen on getting a Korean flex DPS because I think that's one of the worst roles in NA. I think main support and flex DPS are some of the worst roles, but why would you import a main support? Um, and then go from there. But it really felt like the motivation in some of the Korean flex DPS I was talking to was more about just the money and not like, oh, I want to play in Canada. I want to play in NA. Um, and with Merit and someone who we eventually landed on, it really felt like they want to play in NA and they really want to win. And of course, you know, uh, getting them from Korea to America isn't, you know, going to be cheap. They're both champions. They won last year. Um, but I really felt like they um, were really keen to play on a mixed roster again, while a lot of other players felt like it had to be a concession to be on a mixed roster and almost wanted, you know, more money to get that concession. Um, so I'm very excited to work with both Merit and someone. They're both very motivated. Um, and also one of the roadblocks that American teams might run into. It's actually pretty tough to get a Korean visa to America uh, right now. But luckily, as Toronto, we're based in Canada, who has very good relationships uh, with Korea, South Korea. And it's actually very doable to get a visa very quickly. As you could see, with like Spectre on Opener last year, we got to Canada in like three weeks time. Uh, so everything coming together basically gave us that opportunity. And then once we signed Merit and someone, RuPaul really wanted to play with someone again. Um, you know, so that was a piece that could perfectly slot in. Uh, very excited to have RuPaul on board, who I think is the most flexible NA main support. I think, you know, particularly on BAP, Landon might shine. I think Ultraviolet has really, really good moments, uh, especially, you know, just being flexible. But I think RuPaul, uh, especially on a BAP, I think he's overall the most well-rounded flex support. And he was also one of the main leaders on Florida along with someone. So getting that core of RuPaul and someone, uh, you know, worked out really well. And then after that, it was quite natural to add Vega in, who we already had talked to last year when Blizzard said, hey, he turned 17 in the middle of the season. Uh, even though we previously said he could be on your team, he can't be on your team anymore. Uh, so we'll crush his dreams. And then Sugar Free, I think, is the most flexible flex DPS in NA. Probably the only one who's really, really good at Tracer and Genji. Uh, well, well, mostly Tracer. I think there's a couple other good Genjis, but I think uh, having such a flexible flex DPS, I think it was a no-brainer. 
Uh, so that rounded out the roster. But it was really looking at uh, who suits our team from Korea and then adding pieces onto that, the best pieces from North America. One thing that interested me quite a lot when you did your AMA on stream afterwards is he talked about how Merritt was actually almost one of the first pieces that came together and you wanted to lock in. And previously on Toronto in the Overwatch League, you talked a lot about with Spectre and Opener prioritizing people who had very good English skills and could then integrate into a mixed roster a bit more easily. Merritt has maybe less of a reputation for a strong English skill. So why did you opt for someone who potentially doesn't fit in that mold anymore? What made him worth the gamble, I guess? So I think the difference between picking up Spectra and Opener and Merit is Spectra and Opener were mid-season pickups. So we had basically no time to develop their English, while Merit is a very start of the season, like preseason pickup. Uh, so we can work with his English as the season goes on. He's also a hit scan player who I think needs to communicate a little bit less than other roles. Point and click. I think with someone in RuPaul on the roster, you know, you have enough of that leadership, which we kind of lacked last year. Um, and I feel like Merit can really point and click. And I've also gotten confident enough in my Korean where we don't need a separate translator to come in where I can converse with, with Merit in basic Korean uh, when it's really necessary. And then, uh, of course, you know, he will be learning English throughout the season. And he was also on a mixed team last year. So his understanding's quite good, uh, but his speaking's not that good yet. So we're going to offer him English lessons. We're going to be working with him throughout the season. And then me and someone will function as pseudo translators while we really want to achieve that he understands everything in game so someone doesn't need to be an in-game translator as well which he was a little bit last year for rupo in like an inverse sense where yeah. you know uh merit and chorong didn't have as good english so they would speak korean and then someone would translate the important parts to rupo uh we really don't want that obstacle almost in our communication and one thing i found is when you don't have too much option between you know you have to speak english and you're actually motivated to learn uh, you learn english very quickly so i i'm excited to have married come into toronto asap and then work with him throughout the season and at the start it will probably get issues but the international events is really what we have our eyes set on i think one thing that almost needs to be asked when we talk about this roster is because you had so much choice there are some hypotheticals that i think probably come in people's head and why did you end up with these two imports instead of the others? So uh, maybe if I'm a five-year-old trying to build a team, I'd probably immediately go, oh, just get lip and proper. Just get the two two of the best players. Just put them in the team and then you'll just win stuff, right? So why? what put you away from that kind of version of a super team where you just go, who are the best players in the world? Let's get them in the team right away and then just fill the gaps afterwards. It really came out through negotiations. Like, like we've talked to both Lip and Proper. We talked to other players too, right? It's not like that idea didn't come up in my mind. Um, it's really that I felt like a few Korean players really wanted to compete in Korea. And it would take such a financial investment that I felt like they would only come to Toronto because we gave them, you know, so much money rather than because they wanted to play on a Western team again. Um, and that's really not what I wanted to do, because as you could see with teams that were last year, it's like there were a couple super teams built like like Shock, and they, they flopped because there was no effort. Like, how do I phrase this? I think because there was just no synergy between those players eventually right like they all came and they all had high expectations and then as the pressure mounted up their confidence fell and a similar thing happened to us on the fight right so i think what i really wanted to do is lock in a leader piece which could have come in the flex cps role or could have come in the main tank role um which our flex cps options fell through like i talked about earlier just not because we couldn't get them, but because we felt they weren't the best fit. Um, you know, players like on that hamster core, they really wanted to play with a full Korean team and have the, I think, you know, it's no debate that the 
full Korean team has the best chances to win the international events. Uh, so they really want to do that. Um, so in order to take them away from that, it would take such a big investment. And then you're basically getting them only because of the money. And that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted players who felt like a mixed team could actually win uh, and not you know, get third place behind the two other Korean teams. So I think in theory, probably a core of Seeker, Proper, Someone, and then Rupa and Vega might look better than our team. Uh, but I think, you know, the team we ended up with was the team where I felt in the whole period of the Overwatch CS, it's quite long. Uh, has the least chance of booming and has the least chance to fall into the pitfalls that uh, mixed teams can have. I think another pitfall that a lot of teams fall into, and it's certainly something maybe Toronto suffered with last season and something London suffered with last season as well, is getting burned by the meta, getting stuck in a meta which doesn't suit your team. How much of that was a consideration when building this team? And do you look at the roster you've got this time around and think, and is this actually a meta-proof roster? Is there anything that could really hamper you? I think we definitely have uh, holes individually in some of our hero pools, right? There's, that's going to be natural when you sign a five-man roster. One thing uh, with this Overwatch CS format you can be very active about is let's say there's a giant hole somewhere and you can't fill the meta. It's actually a lot easier to contract a player just for one tournament in this system. So even though you start out with a five man roster, and I think our five man roster is the most flexible roster you can create out of NA. I think almost undoubtedly, maybe you could say, you know, some of the imports you could have gone lip over merit where I think lip is a little bit more flexible than merit. Uh, but I think Merit really has that X factor in tournaments. I've never seen him prefer bad in a tournament, um, both 2022 and 2023. But coming back to your question, yeah, I really feel like this was the most flexible roster we could have made out of NA. And if there's holes, like let's say, you know, it appears throughout the season that uh, someone can't play Doom or... Uh, Vega can't play a second flex support that well, or maybe Sugar Free still has issues on May. Um, you know, that that's something you can look at after trying it. And because these majors are such important spikes now, uh, it's definitely something you have to keep a look at. But one thing we really want to focus on is keeping a tight core. And I think with this five man roster, we're basically set for every meta bar like some very outlier metas like you know lucio brig or, or stuff like that right but i don't think anyone can build for that and not with five players i think with five players you'd be really really hard pushed to build like a truly a truly complete team in that sense was was it ever a consideration when building a roster like i look at sugar free is maybe the best example of this is when you take sugar free out of the pool of american flex dps the gap between Sugar Free and then everyone else is very large, as opposed to maybe taking Seeker out of a hit scan pool when there's maybe a bit more talent behind Seeker. Was there ever a consideration when you were building the team that, well, if I take Sugar Free out of the pool for everyone else, that gives us a way bigger competitive advantage in America versus maybe taking a hit scan player out or a flex support out or something and keeping my import slot somewhere else? Yeah, 100%. Like the the reason I really wanted uh, Sugar Free quite quickly and Vega quite quickly is because I think they are the biggest outstanders compared to the rest uh, on their role. So, you know, I think taking Sugar Free was only naturally once we had locked in someone, right? Once we had locked in someone at Merit, I had already been talking to a lot of the American players. Uh, to see where they fit in, and, I, and especially between the American players, I basically had my pick. You know, some of them were even waiting to sign their contracts to wait what Toronto was doing. Um, so, you know, taking Sugar Free, it's such a big advantage on certain metas, right? I don't think Sugar Free is uh, the most well-rounded player yet, but I think he's the most well-rounded NA Flex DPS. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that would be very hard. Very hard to disagree with that. I think it's, yeah, puts you at a significant advantage in that department unless anyone else can start importing players as well. As it stands, obviously, there's still a lot to unfold in terms of if any other orgs come into America, but the the building of this team really sort of screams you have to win America, right? You have to be the best team in America. Would anything less than that sort of just be an unacceptable failure, really? I don't want to put those expectations into people's head, um, but I think, you know, if we don't win NA, I feel like it almost be as big of a fumble as Atlanta in the playoffs this year. Um, you know, I think we built this this roster to do well internationally, but there's steps to that, right? And I think we're really working toward this these majors, you know, in Dallas and in Stockholm. Uh, and maybe we won't do as well at the start. I don't know yet. We haven't started scrimming yet because the new patch hasn't come out yet. It's coming out as of the day of recording, um, and we'll start scrimming soon after this. So I think it would be deemed a failure, but I think any team that has these expectations on them has it quite hard, and I, as a coach, will have the task to manage those expectations and make sure my players are comfortable every match because I also know that everybody wants us to fail, and they're all going to share our scrim codes, and they're all going to you know, leak leak our VODs and do, ask what to do against us. So you know, expecting that um, and managing the player expectations and making sure you know we don't let those expectations get to that is going to be really paramount, especially since that's something we struggled with last year too, right? Everybody expected the AT core to do insanely well now that they're all on one team. And especially in that first half of the season, uh, didn't look that good. Didn't look as good as we wanted it to. So I think with, with some of the issues we've shored up, especially uh, I'd say, you know, in the underperforming in maths, because actually last year we did quite well in scrims. Um, the leadership, I think, ties into underperforming in match. I think if you have one, you know, leader in front of the team that everybody can rely on, they can just play their game. Um, and putting our system in place from day one, uh, because last year it really felt like I was getting a whole team and we more adapted to their system as a defiant, which might have been the wrong play but i also think if you're getting a full team you can't instantly you know make them do what you want uh you have to try what they want first to actually building my team and this is fully my team and we're gonna do my system from day one uh it's gonna be very good and you know going a little bit into my system i want to be the middle of what Askoft and gumba have i think gumba is too harsh <laughs> i think Askoft is too much of a you know just do whatever you guys want. Uh, I want to be, you know, we do a 30-minute player VOD of you or a 30-minute coach-led VOD of you at the start of the day. But at the end of the day, we have more of a player-led VOD of you where I more mediate, uh, right? And enforcing these time slots and enforcing our schedule uh, and enforcing the system that we want uh, is going to be going to be so key. Because there is maybe a concern there, at least from a coaching perspective, that the way this roster has fallen is you've actually got three Florida players on the roster. So I don't know if this was necessarily the intention when going about building it, but you've sort of ended up with almost the core of an existing team. Is there much worry then that there'll be at least some sort of teething period when as I, oh, that's not what we used to do in Florida. In Florida, we did it like this. Can we do it like this? And there's maybe an element for you to manage there to get your ideas over potentially those pre-existing ideas. Yeah, no, I... When building the roster, I didn't mean to pick up the Florida core, actually. It just so ended up that those players, um, you know, one really wanted to play together. So they were they were making consensus in order to be able to play with each other again, which always helps. And then two, I just felt like um, building a core on someone as a player is so strong that this ended up falling together. But as a coach, I think I I am would be crazy if I'm not worried about that, right? But I also feel like they were smart enough to know that some of the things that they did with Gumba 
wasn't good and some of the things that was really good actually right and the things that were really good i'll be looking to do myself right i think one of the things that gumba does that i really want to copy this year actually since we're a dominant force in na is review every lost map because we likely won't be losing that many maps in scrims uh so every lost map i think should be like really taken under a loop and seen why it was lost or if we have a scrim that's easy put handicaps on ourselves right start playing not the meta comp in order to prepare for you know something else that might come especially in this first stage where it's only played for circuit points basically um so i think you know i'm looking to copy the good things i'm looking to add my own system uh, and basically base it on that and i think what we had on toronto at the end of last year was actually really solid so i'm looking to build on that and of course you know if they have good things they want to bring in uh, we can always look to incorporate those you feel you have to come in with a particular mindset this time as you are you're due to be the favorite team and that comes with a lot of additional pressure and a lot of additional stress compared to say being a toronto or a london or a washington last year where you're always sort of trying to punch up what sort of things are you going to try and do to give that mindset? Does it maybe reflect back to maybe your time on shock? Because obviously you spent some time on shock where you were the big dog team. You were expected to win every match. How different is that mindset? And how are you going to go about trying to, I guess, get that sort of a, we call it like a championship mindset into the players? Now we we should win every game. We should have these expectations. We want to, we want to do as well as we can. I think what, I keep repeating to the players is not take the things we have for granted, right? I think a big thing is we're one of the few teams that are now housing players, right? At the start of this, the year, this was a debate, should we house players? But, um, you know, one thing everyone should know is that our American players gave up some of their salary and Toronto added a little more in order to get these players' apartments and get them all in Toronto. So, you know, we're actually quite lucky with everything we've gotten and with the players we've gotten and how uh, willing to give things as well they are in order for us to perform the best. Um, and, you know, with that, I just really want to say to, you know, the team that I have is like, we're in a lucky position, so we must work hard for it every day. We must set goals. We must, you know almost live up to the expectations of a signed team. You know, the X6, XQC comes into mind where it's like, they went to Korea, uh, you know, they got Koreans and stuff. So I'm sure, you know, if teams do well against us, uh, they, they'll start screaming stuff like that. So we don't want that to happen. And we want to be the top dogs. And, you know, we had our first team meeting yesterday and someone instantly came in and said, you know, even if we're winning scrims, we cannot take this for granted and we must still review, you know, and we must still practice our hardest because we've got this opportunity. So I really want to make that the the headline this year. And let's say, you know, scrims in an A uh, are just stomps all the time. Then we're going to be looking to scrim in a U and we're going to be looking to play at a West Coast and look to scrim some of the Korean teams, right? Like, being in Toronto, we actually have insane internet connection with our bell, <laughs> which you, you love to <laughs> advertise on, on, on Coachable too. Uh, no, so we're, we're going to be looking to make it hard for ourselves this year and really simulate uh, a harder than match environment almost by, by putting pressure on ourselves and by punishing lost maps um, in scrims already so that those expectations are already a little bit there for scrims. And then in matches, actually ease off the pressure a little bit, right? Like three days before the match, stop going so hard on reviews and stop doing so much individual feedback. So the players have time to let it sink in, more relax, and then go into the match full focus. Because there is a situation where essentially America, the American region might just sort of become yours. It might become quite straightforward, especially depending on how the other teams form. So then where do your expectations land when we start looking internationally then? Like, can you beat Europe? Can you beat Korea? Or maybe more specifically, can you beat Falcons? How do you approach these sort of challenges and where do you think your power level is? 
amongst maybe the best team in Europe is probably London right now. The best team in Korea is probably Hampton or, well, Falcons right now. I think it's always going to be very meta-dependent based on what region's going to be the best, right? I think Europe, if it's a Ryan May meta, you guys are going to be insane, right? You guys are going to be very tough to beat. Um, Korea, if it's going to be a dive meta with, let's say, Sojourn Tracer, and you got Stalker on Sojourn, you got, you got Proper on Sojourn, and you got Stalker on Tracer, is going to be incredibly tough to beat. So it's always going to be a little bit of luck. I think the best thing to do is just prepare for the most scenarios possible. Um, scrim these best EU teams. Scrim the best NA team, which I think is Windfrob right now, and there's a couple of teams being built right now. Look to scrim the best Korean teams. When you go to you know, a LAN, look to get there early and scrim the best teams early to prepare and adapt to what they're doing. Um, and I think... Uh, Especially, you know, when you ask, do we expect to beat Hamster or I guess Falcons now? Um, you know, it's going to depend on the meta and we're going to try our damn hardest. Uh, but I think, you know, that roster looks so solid where it's going to take us outperforming ourselves throughout the season and really keep building on what we're doing. And it's going to require them to slack off, right? I think when it comes to Europe, I think Europe is such a meta-dependent region, uh, almost, especially you know with with, with Spitfire. Um, it's going to take a be a little bit more flexible than what we did with Toronto Defiant last year against London Spitfire, um, and have you guys be unlucky with the meta, have us be a little lucky and just prepared for for whatever comes at us, right? I think. Um, like you said last year, we probably won't be Ryan mirroring someone against Hottie, but I'm sure you know we can we can figure out a way, depending on the meta, to to beat your guys' style. Because I think with what we've built, we can uh, swap everything and make every counter. So it's going to take a lot of creativity and not just mirroring when we're losing. Uh, and I think that's one thing that really drew me to this roster too. It's one of the teams you can be creative with, right? I think a lot of winning Koreans, a lot of champion Koreans actually have this ego where they're like, if we just mirror, we're going to win. But I think both someone, Merit, and you know the other pieces on our roster will never have that attitude because they won last year playing not the mirror. Yeah. So as a coach, that gives you a lot of flexibility in like, I have this good idea, we have to, you know, try that. Or I have this good idea, and then not just mirror, right? And and try to figure out the hard way before falling back to the easy route of just mirroring, because that's one one trap. You know, for example, we fell into a shock in 2022. It's like, oh, just mirror, and then you know, look look to see if we can win because we have the best players in the world. You know, when we talk about where you guys are then in terms of sort of timeline and logistics. So obviously everyone's signed and locked in. You're going to be using, if I understand right, the Toronto facilities again, the same one the Overwatch League team used last year. So everything's pretty ready to go in that side. When are you guys looking to start scrimming? When are you going to be able to get the guys over from Korea? And when does it all, when does your, it all kick off this year for you? So there's almost two timelines. Um, there is a medical checkup that needs to be performed to make it from Korea to Canada. Okay. Um, and that medical checkup has a little bit of a waiting line. So we're looking to see uh, every day in calling hospitals whether or not we can speed up that medical checkup. Uh, but if that doesn't happen too quickly, um, you know, the latest it will be end of February. Uh, so it's still before the start of the season, but that will be the latest. We're looking to speed it up. If it doesn't happen quickly, we would start scrimming remotely, which I personally despise scrimming remotely. Um, you could see with teams like Shock last year how much they despised it too, right? The ping, the sleep schedule, um, you know, the four Koreans staying up until 5 a.m. and living with your parents, uh, not being able to speak. It's, it's just, just not great. Um, so we're looking to fly them in as early as possible. 
probably as early as next week from when this gets released. And then we're looking to scrim from there. Then if that, that can't happen, we'll start scrimming remotely in that first week. Uh, but we're basically, no matter what, looking to start next week. Um, and, you know, really, we've already had our discussions and we've already had team meetings, which we can all do remote, about what our standards are going to be, what our focus goals are going to be. Um, everybody's going to be grinding their ass off in ranked, and even a few players are playing in makeshift scrim teams just to, you know, see what the meta is and how it plays. And It's basically a new game with this patch. So yeah. I've, I've put everybody, you know, a, a, a talking of like, yeah, this is where the season basically starts because 1st of March is when, you know, the competition starts and it's going to be every weekend a ton of games so you don't have that much time to prep. It's going to be very different in many ways because a lot of the Overwatch League format was every week you play one game, maybe two games, you have a chance to prepare quite specifically. You know the maps you got to prepare, you have this, whereas now it's going to be a lot more condensed in terms of you get a longer time to prepare, and maybe a quite comfortable Swiss stage to just keep practicing, but then you're going to have a very compact, this weekend we have to play four or five games, we have to try and win them all. Don't know who we're going to be playing one day to the next. A lot more variety. Uh, one thing that might be expected with a team that has org support is you obviously get more support staff with that, whereas a lot of teams might just be running a quite tight ship in terms of here's the players, here's one coach. What Do you have much support staff in the way of that? Because obviously so far you're sort of announced as the lone coach. Is there anything else you're going to be getting in terms of any other support staff or coaches or anything the org provides on that front? So when the org asked me, um, you know, how do we win? I basically said, let's get the best players possible and building a big support staff because I think every team isn't going to build a big support staff uh, was secondary. So I'm going to be the sole coach, but we are going to look to bring on a data analyst because I feel like especially with this new face it system and having the map bands that they now have, uh, basically, it's you're gonna get two map bands. Like each each team is gonna get one map band, then one team picks, and then reverse that. Uh, so you're gonna have map bands. So I think it's more important than ever to look at your scrim data and look at oh this team is really good at that map. Let's ban out that map, and that team's really good at that map. Let's ban that out. Basically, having those stats and having somebody you know who's smart about Overwatch too to keep track of what these teams are really good at. Uh, one interesting idea that I was already thinking of with this is there's not that many dive maps in the pool. How about teams just fully focus on playing rush and then just ban out all the dive maps, right? That's something that's possible, and it's really important to see what each team's strength is to know if oh should I ban out a dive map this week or should I not? Um, and having somebody to keep track of that and somebody to also help the team with and helping me giving info is going to be really paramount. Uh, so the system we're going to look to set up there is we're going to look to bring in a data analyst who's going to be keeping track of all those stats and then also helping me in the game of like, is this the best comp? Uh, what is this region playing? And basically more creative ideas with these map bands, right? Like I think the the one I said is basically the top of the iceberg, but how about you try to bait the enemy team into making a certain ban, yeah. right? You keep picking a certain map against them in scrims uh, to try and bait them into banning that map, even though maybe that's not your best map at all. So it's going to be a lot more mind games. Um, and I think that's where having somebody that does stats and, and is, is there to look at that as well as help the players and help me uh, it's going to be really nice to have. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's really something we've never had in Overwatch before. And you look at it in other games, say in like Counter Strike, lots of teams will in, in invoke a perma ban system. So we just go, oh, there's loads of maps in the map pool. Can we just knock a map out of the map pool for us in like all the different modes? Can we just make our practice more efficient? Or can we do like what you said? Can we target the enemy in some way? Or it gets layered and layered and layered and layered as we go through tournaments. Can we then bait? Oh, we know they're going to permaban this, but what if we change our permaban without the other team knowing? Can we get our heads up on them? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of good things about this new face it system that will open up a lot of avenues from a more tactical perspective. But all of that sounds pretty good, and I'm sure 
Am I right in understanding of you selling your MMA as well? You're going to be trying to put out content similar or in some form like you did last year. So we'll actually get a bit more of an inside look once the guys are all out in Toronto and what it's like for you out there. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the big things about Toronto compared to other teams, is we still have sponsors, right? And with those sponsors comes making a lot of content. And what we're looking to do is making more fun content this year. I think with, you know, the league being as it was, uh, it was more of a formal and structured system where we were really looking to push out high quality uh, content that was pretty fun. But I think this year we're going to look to level that up, do like way more fun stuff where it's just like, um, you know, some of the stuff we did last year with the, oh, guess what sound this is, stuff like that. I think we're going to be looking to push out more like scrim content, more comms and what basically the people want, like an inside look into what we're doing. I think with Overwatch League being gone and with there being such periods of like, oh, this is just not an important month. This is not as important of a month as, you know, a major month. I think in those times, you can show a little bit more of the curtain, which is, I think, what all the fans want. That's maybe when you start screaming scrims. That's when, you know, you push out maybe, you know, highlights of a, of a scrim VOD in, in you know, in, in your YouTube channel. So those are all going to be things that we're going to be looking to do. Um, and then, of course, we're going to be looking to keep up series, same as last year with the docu-series, which... You know, I think I recommend everybody to watch that because I think it was one of the highest quality behind the curtains peaks that was still there in the Overwatch League. And I think in Overwatch League Season 2, every team had this. I know we had it on Atlanta. Um, and it's really something where we're basically documenting our progress through all these years. Um, and, you know, that's definitely something we're looking to do this year because we are one of the only teams that has as much of a system as we do. Uh, so we're also looking to make an example out of what Oris could do in the future with Overwatch CS. I think one thing that we've certainly found with Uncoachable as well is that there is a demand for this behind the scenes look. And if you look at maybe a lot more traditional sports, some of the most successful content that is made around those is behind the scenes ones where you get to go into the dressing room, you get to see the coach interact with the players. You get to see what it, how the players react after a loss, how they react after a win. And that behind the scenes look, I think is something that's, especially within Overwatch, a pretty untapped market. And I think there's a lot of room for growth there. So I think, yeah, I'd, I'd very much echo the recommendation of any of that Toronto content. And hopefully we get a lot more of good stuff. Before we go, Kasaurus, is there any any last message you want to say for any or any long-standing Toronto fans and any future fans of the team this year? I think everybody could be really proud and excited about what Toronto has to offer this year. I think, you know, it's such an incredible team when even though um, you know, a lot of teams might be backing out of Overwatch. I feel like this year really shows the passion that Toronto ownership and our CEO, Adam, have in Overwatch. So I think as a fan, uh, I hope we bring a lot more fans on board, but especially the old standing fans, you know, really thank you for keeping supporting us. And, you know, I think Canada Overwatch and Overwatch in general in NA, uh, should be looking at Toronto and what we're looking to do this year because we're not only looking to do good domestically, we're looking to take over and looking to do good at these land tournaments. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to all of that. Thank you for joining me today and thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me.